Welcome to section 2.8. Uh, during this section, we're going to talk about ribosomes and mitochondria, which are two of the more talked about organelles. Uh, I guess you could say they might be fairly important in terms of some of the others, but all organelles tend to do their job. Uh, so we'll just say these are some of the more common ones they discuss. These are some of the ones that we make a bigger deal about. So ribosomes are going to usually appear as just small dots. So when you see them in pictures, they'll be attached to the nuclear envelope sometimes. They'll be attached to this endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. So you'll see right here that there's this blue stuff that's connected to the nucleus. That's the ER. And the rough ER is what we call the stuff that has these little dots, the ribosomes, on it. Uh, if you look at many pictures, you'll also see ribosomes that are just kind of floating out here. Uh, those are called free ribosomes. So they can also be found throughout the cell. It's not just attached to something. Now the mitochondria, that's the guy labeled 9. And so you can see this one's closed up, and it's a large organelle. So relatively speaking, it's one of the biggest organelles, uh, besides the nucleus at least, uh, that you'll tend to find in a cell. And if you kind of peel it open, if you rip away the outer membrane, you'll see it does have a more complicated inner structure. Uh, this is not going to be a simple organelle that just has one membrane and then more or less some cytoplasm type stuff inside. This one's going to have a little bit more involved in terms of a double membrane. It's going to have, it's, it's going to be a more complex organelle. One of the most complex ones that we'll talk about, period. So starting off, let's start with one of the easiest ones. The ribosomes, these guys are probably the smallest organelle that there is. They don't have a membrane that surrounds them. They're just these two subunits. So you've got the large one, which you can see here looks bigger. And you've got the small subunit, which is going to be the smaller one. So red and blue is what it shows here. Red is the large, blue is the small. But the way ribosomes work is these two things will attach. And when they attach, uh, they'll go through a process called translation that allows them to build a protein. And so they themselves are going to be composed of rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA. So this will be made from DNA. Uh, this is just going to be a special type of RNA that's used in ribosomes. And then they'll be made of some proteins. And you can see in the picture here that there's these kind of complex structures, things interweave, because it's going to be not just one thing. It's technically a mesh of this rRNA and the protein together that does the job. And because, it ha because it's so small and it has no membrane, this means that it's, any cell can have it. Uh, we've mentioned before that prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles. Well, these aren't membrane-bound. So that explains why ribosomes are universal. Everybody needs to have those proteins. At least all modern-day cells need their proteins. And ribosomes are the guys that make it for every cell that we're aware of. So this will not be specific to eukaryotes like some of the other organelles we'll talk about, starting with the mitochondria and the nucleus. Uh, but these ones ultimately are going to be in all cells. Now, translation is just going to be a process that we're very briefly going to touch on here. It's just, I want to make sure you guys realize this is the name for the process by which they make proteins. So if we talk about and say an RNA or a um, ribosome makes proteins that ultimately helps convert RNA, uh, specifically in this case it would be an mRNA, would be what the message is encoded in. And so it would kind of read this mRNA and build the protein according to the directions that are part of that mRNA. So the mRNA is the blueprint, and the ribosomes are going to kind of look through that blueprint and say, all right, this is what needs to go here, and they will get the right amino acids to build us the protein in question. So that process will be called translation. And so the ribosomes are ultimately going to have RNA pieces that act as something called ribozymes. Now this one shouldn't be too crazy. You have ribonucleic acid. That's what RNA is. Uh, and the zyme part is like enzymes. Those are our catalysts. So these will essentially be RNA enzymes. So enzymes are proteins. There's an RNA version of it, so we call them ribozymes instead of just calling them enzymes. And so that's what the RNA is going to kind of function as here in this ribosome, which will allow it to make protein. Now there's two types of ribosomes, we said. Free ones, which are going to be found in the cytoplasm, as I write very sloppily. Uh, and then we've got bound ones, which will be attached to that endoplasmic reticulum. That was the stuff we talked about where they were kind of stuck on it, just like they can be stuck to the nuclear envelope. And the main thing here is these bound guys tend to make proteins that are going to be either in the membrane of the cell or are going to leave the cell. Like we're getting rid of them. We're dumping these enzymes outside the cell. Whereas free ribosomes, which are found in the cytoplasm, will, make, uh, and will ultimately make proteins that are needed inside the cell. So if I want to make an enzyme that's going to do cell respiration that needs to occur in the cell, I'd use a free ribosome. If I want to produce enzymes that I'm going to secrete 
that I'm going to get rid of that I'm going to dump into the surrounding space so it can kind of munch at whoever's around me that I don't like or I'm competing against, I would use bound ribosomes because there's just a different pathway that they follow, whereas the ones produced th that are attached to the ER eventually get taken to the surface of the cell uh, and either embedded into it or released. And so whichever place you build it at determines where it's going to end up. Now, as we transition, we'll get to the mitochondria, or the mitochondria, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, this guy is commonly referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. So if you took this in like sixth grade, or if you watched the Magic School Bus or something, they'll probably talk about this as being the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, but really what this does is it does a process called cellular respiration, specifically aerobic, that's the one that uses oxygen, and it produces ATP. And if you remember, ATP is the same thing as far as our cells are concerned, as energy. That's what our cells use for energy. So the mitochondria is very important for us, especially if you're a cell that's doing a lot of work. So the number will vary where a skin cell would have very few because a skin cell does pretty much nothing. You know, it's the equivalent of a couch potato if you're talking about cells. Uh, it just sits there on your skin. Whereas if you talk about something like a muscle cell, uh, a muscle cell will have in the hundreds to perhaps even thousands of mitochondria because it's doing so much work. I mean, it's trying to use up energy that lets it contract so it can tug on things forcefully to allow us to move, to allow us to hold our position, to allow us to do whatever. But a lot of us aren't that skinny. You know, there's a fair amount of mass. Even if you're skinny, you're oftentimes talking where your arms probably weigh 10 pounds or more. And so if you're trying to hold those up, I mean, it's kind of like picking up a 10 pound weight and holding that up. It's not gonna be easy. It takes a lot of ATP to do this. And so in a muscle cell, you would typically see at least hundreds, if not more, to make sure that they can cope with that. So the number will vary based upon your job. And then if you look at the structure, they have this outer membrane, which we won't talk about too much. It doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, they have an inner membrane called the cristae. That's just the fancy name for that inner membrane, uh, where it's all folded. And the folds increase the surface area because there are chemical reactions that occur uh, in that membrane. And so by increasing the amount of surface area, you increase the number of reactions that can occur. So it's like imagining that you had uh, money-making machines. You might want to arrange it where you have room for more money-making machines because then you make more money. And so if you only have a specific number of, of locations where you can embed these guys to make energy, you ultimately can fold up the membrane to give us more locations. So you get more energy. So it'll have this inner folded membrane called the cristae. The very innermost part, so the equivalent of like the cytoplasm of the mitochondria, will be called the matrix, the parent of the red pill. Uh, and then you have in between these two membranes, it's called the intermembrane space. Not exactly a really clever name, it just says exactly what it is, between membrane space. Uh, the other really cool thing about mitochondria is they will have their own DNA. And they do have their own ribosomes. They've got these little dots here you can see. And so it's kind of cool where uh, when we talk about the mitochondria, it appears that the mitochondria came from a prokaryotic cell, that there was a process called endosymbiosis. Endo means in, symbiosis means to live with. So it appears that a larger prokaryotic cell, if you will, or eukaryotic, early eukaryotic, whatever, uh, would have kind of eaten, ingested, wrapped around, and engulfed this particular prokaryote that was able to do aerobic respiration, that was able to make ATP uh, very efficiently, that had these kind of internal proteins and enzymes embedded in its membrane and, and in its cytoplasm. And so it, it surrounded it by its own membrane. It kind of hugged it, gave it the hug of death, and brought it in. But it forgot to eat it. And it seems like as the two lived together, because it forgot to eat it, uh, this particular guy that got ingested, this prokaryote that got eaten, uh, was able to take the food from the host cell, you know, the bigger cell, and was able to break it down and produce more ATP than the original host cell could, because it could do cell respiration more efficiently. So this original host cell, probably per sugar, was able to make about 2 ATP, whereas this new guy was able to make, per sugar, about 38 ATP. So if this guy said, like, I'll donate some ATP to you, even if it just gave it half, you know, said, you provide me the food, I'll keep half, you get half. That still would be way more than the original host cell ever would have gotten normally. You know, 19 ATP per sugar is so much better than two. 
And so these guys appear then to have come up with this truce where they're like, all right, this is working out well for both of us. So they live together. And eventually over time, what happened is it looks like some of the, the DNA kind of moved from the mitochondria into the nucleus. And so the cell, the host cell, gained some measure of control over that prokaryote that eventually became the mitochondria. So once it gained some control over it, where it could send it signals and kind of tell it what to do, we stopped thinking of it as a endosymbiote, this separate guy living inside, and we kind of now look at it and say it's an organelle called the mitochondria. But if you look at how the mitochondria reproduces, it reproduces asexually, it does so just like prokaryotes do. Uh, we look at the fact it has its own DNA and its own ribosome, so it can make some of its own stuff. And so it still behaves a lot like a prokaryotic cell living inside of another cell. But it's controlled enough by the actual host cell that we don't consider it to be a separate cell anymore. We do consider it at this point to just be a mitochondria, to be a specific organelle that does that task. So endosymbiosis, that's why it's important it has a double membrane. If you remember the mitochondria, it looked kind of like this. All the cool stuff for a mitochondria is embedded in the inner membrane because that would be the membrane that was the outer membrane of the cell that got eaten, right? Because this outer membrane was the one that was wrapped around by the host cell. When it kind of brought it in and ingested it, it wrapped it up in its own membrane and brought it inside. And so this inner membrane, the cristae, would have been the original prokaryote membrane. And we see that that one is where all the good stuff is actually. And so it's the matrix, this innermost part, and it's the cristae. These are the places where all the actual stuff happens, all the actual cell respiration. And that makes sense because the cell respiration that was so efficient was being done by that prokaryote. And we see even to this day, it's the cell inside, if you will. It's this inner part, this inner cell membrane, this inner cytoplasm. That's what still does most of the cell respiration and makes the ATP. This outer membrane uh, and the space kind of around it, it's not doing a whole lot. It's not the necessary part. So it appears this original prokaryote, that inner part, the cristae in the matrix, that's where the magic happens. And it happens that way because at one point, it used to be a separate cell that got eaten.